Amon? All right, everyone, welcome back for another week of East Oaks to East Oaktober. I always want to say East Oaks-tober, man. I always want to say it. <laughs> East Oaktober. We're so excited to have you back. Today, we're going to conquer our fears on lighting and, uh, and color study. So what we're going to do is for the first little bit, first duration, I have found so many people asking me about lighting scenarios. And I also did a lecture not too long ago with Portrait Society on the subject matter, and a lot of people were so thankful to know that information. So today is the one of the few days where I, there's actual, a bit of, not teaching, but a bit of content for you to like learn from. So if you've never done lighting, this is for you. So what we're gonna do is do a couple of the real basic scenarios of single uh, light source lighting that have been used all the way from the Renaissance period all the way up to present day, you'll see that they keep using the same lighting scenarios even in cinematography uh, and photography. So uh, most of these things are coming from those sources. The first one, we, by the way, let's introduce everyone that we have today. We have Tina Figarelli over here with me just as uh, last Friday. She gets to join me again today. Mm -hmm. And then behind the switcher and the lovely voice that you'll hear today is Evie, her behind. Hello, everyone. And then also today, my dear friend Jay has uh, been so gracious to be our model uh, this afternoon, who is an artist in his own right. He does, he's a muralist. And uh, we'll have to make sure to like, if you have an Instagram or something to put that on there. So, uh, but he's gonna be our model. He's got a great face for this because he's got lots of great chiseled angles. You know, it's that good masculine <laughs> face there. Yeah. <laughs> I needed him to get a little red in the face so that I could get that color in. So, all right. But without further ado, we're going to first start with, um, with different lighting scenarios. Now, I have a light source that is stationary. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about three different angles that are actually using the same light source. And all I'm going to do is have him rotate his head. Uh, to do it. So the first one, which is probably the most common known, is called the Rembrandt Triangle. So um, what I'm going to do, and Evie, if you could just put the camera on just Jay's uh, camera. Yep. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk up and I'm going to show you what this, what this is accomplishing. So uh, Rembrandt was known for it. That's why it's called the Rembrandt Triangle. But basically, rotate just a touch more this way. Basically, there is a patch of light coming on this side of the face that creates a bit of an upside down triangle. Uh, and so that's why they call it the Rembrandt triangle. It's basically a three quarter light coming across the face and just hits a touch of the other side. Um, that's really great. I always talk a lot about like light balance. And if you think like the yin yang symbol, you know, where you have a little bit of dark in the, a lot of light and a little bit of light in the dark. This is a little bit of light in the dark. So the other one is called the Van Dyke Z, and that's if you could just rotate a little bit, keep on going. Van Dyke Z basically was the most common lighting system that Van Dyke would do, use. And if you notice, is a shadow that comes across the top of the brow, drops down to the right side of the face, and then comes underneath the nose, and it creates a bit of a Z uh, shadow shape. So then the other one, which is if he goes a little bit and turns all the way down, I have him rotating his face down. This is called butterfly lighting, and this is more, you can see this in uh, old master paintings as well, but this is also very common to use in the fashion industry now. The reason it's called butterfly lighting is that if you look at the shadow shape below the nose, some people think that it looks like a butterfly. So it's, it, all it is is an isolated shadow shape underneath the nose, and everything else is in light except a little bit of the eye, uh, the brow shadow on both sides of the face. Now, all of these can be accomplished by moving the light source or rotating the person and rotating your vantage point with your camera or when you're painting from life, rotating yourself over to be able to be in front or on the side, okay? Now, 
we're going to go over two more lighting sources, which is split light. And so for that, I'm going to turn this light source on over here. And I'm going to turn this light source off so that you can see it better. So for those who um, couldn't see the first light source that's off screen, it's kind of like hanging from above at an angle um, from the left-hand side, and now there's two. There we go. All right. Now, if you really want drama in your portrait, this is <clears throat> a source called split light, which is basically half of the face is lit and half of the face is in shadow. Now, uh, often I tell people that the main light source is called a key light. And the reason this is important to know is not necessarily the term, but to know that one light source should always be dominant versus another light source that you may have in the room. And the key light is the main light source that's dominant. Um, this secondary light source is called a fill light. And a fill light is what you could use also to you could use a light to bounce or use a, a, a reflector to bounce light off, and that could be used as a fill light, or you could use a very broad light source. Say, you know, you had a larger light over on the right side of his face that was much more mild, uh, less intense, hitting that side of the face, and it's just to bring the shadows up a little bit so they don't look so, so, so dark. Um, and then the, fin the final light source, and this is an add, I'm going to add to this light, but it's called a rim light. And I'm going to just come over here and plug this light in so that you can see. what a rim light looks like. And in this instance, I have the rim light cooler, and it's just dragging over the right side of his face. Can they see that really well? Good, yeah. It's just dragging on the, over on the right side of his face. So um, these, write these terms down, go look them up, and you'll find tons of resources on uh, you know, on photography blogs and things that show you how to set up these light sources. So just remember, key light, fill light, rim light, and then Rembrandt Triangle, um, Van Dyke Z, and Butterfly, and Split Light. So there are two other sources, but they are really more about the angle at which you are to the person's face, which is called broad light and short light. And that just basically means that you're on the, the light, more on the light side of his face at your vantage point, where the broad light is basically taking over most of his face, and the shadow side is just a small sliver, and then short light is just the opposite. It would be that you stand on the opposite side of the light source, and there's just a small amount of light hitting and a larger amount of the fill of his face hitting your eye. So. Now that we've kind of gone over that, and I know that was a bit of a crash course, we're going to set up him in a either Van Dyke Z or Rembrandt triangle scenario. And I'm going to turn this light off. And we're going to try to do two different color studies. So hopefully that was helpful for everyone. And if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And Evie will let us know what you're saying and asking, and we'll hopefully be able to answer that. Mm -hmm. um, so let me just turn this light back on real quick. I usually have a remote, but it's on my phone, and I'm using my phone to film. So We're doing I'm using the high-tech mm -hmm. high stick here to <laughs> take care of the situation. Um, OK. so. Now that we've talked about that, the next thing is, is I feel like a lot of people don't take the time to do color studies. But I want you to know, <laughs> Jay saying first and foremost here, um, I want you to know this is part of my normal practice whenever I'm doing commission work. And here's an example. If I'm, I'm sure that a couple of you have been to my Instagram, but um, I'm gonna put this here. This is a color study 
of one of my commissions and I show these to my uh, clients to show them what the color harmony is going to be. And that's all it's for. I don't use it to try to get the drawing perfect or to try to get a face likeness. I'm using it just um, to get swaths of paint up there to see the relationships, the harmony and relationships of things, okay? Now, there are people that will do larger studies and they'll do them more involved. People like, you know, Will St. John and Colleen Barry both do much more involved studies. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can make them into um, their own paintings in a way. And then, you know, if you're a professional, you could sell both the study as well as the painting. And Evie recently had worked on um, a hawk and had done a, a study and did it very involved and a larger one. And now she has two beautifully finished paintings um, that she can market. So, but today we're going to work solely on quick color studies to try to get the big look and the big picture. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and just dive in. Um, now I told Jay to wear whatever he wanted to, and I love that because he came in with this crazy colors teal, and uh, I was like, I need to put lemon, cad lemon on my palette to make sure I can mix this color. <laughs> it's a great color. It is. It's, it looks great on your skin. And yes. his eyes. It really brings out I'm his eyes. I'm telling you, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Too bad. Really it's... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> For our Mark brand. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was looking in the mirror and was like, you know what? This, this outfit's just not bringing out my eyes. I need to put that teal on. I did a, color, a digital color study first on what was good on me. Oh, there you go. There. I love it. All right, everyone. So if you have a model, um, you know, pose your model, set up the lighting. If you don't, you can use a master copy and you can talk about, identify the lighting scenario of the portrait and do a color study of the master copy. Now, in the next couple of days, that's what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be using master copies, or, or old, old master paintings, and doing a, basically a color study of the master copy for the Zorn palette, for taming the primaries, and for uh, crazy color day. So uh, keep that in mind, um, that you are welcome to use whatever you want, the more important thing is, is that you give this a practice. Give it a go. Um, so we've got quite a few people on the stream saying hi. Um, and for those of you who haven't yet, please say hi. Feel free to tell us where you're logging in from. Um, tell us what you're working on right now or what you're interested in seeing. Um, what kind of lighting you think you might try in the future. Um, yeah, let's see. We've got... Uh, we've got Judith from Virginia and Julie from France. Bonjour. Oh. Um, sorry for my pronunciation. <laughs> um, uh, Jean from Florida and Paula from Maryland. Um, we've got Jonathan who wanted to watch live but unfortunately has to watch later, which is perfectly fine. The video will be up on YouTube once we're done streaming live. Um, we've got Stephanie from North Carolina. Hello. Awesome. Local peeps. Um, Margie from Minnesota. Gail from Oregon. Alyssa, who says good day from Australia. Oh. <laughs> Alyssa's been with us every day. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We've got Mia from Sweden. Nice. Uh, I recognize Mia's name. Yeah, it's fun. Discord. It's fun to see people's oh, nice. names kind of becoming familiar. It's mm -hmm. really fun. Uh, I've got Sean Kelly from Utah. Um, let's see. Damien from Indiana. And Sue from Virginia. And Rosalie from Mesa, Arizona. Thanks so much, y'all, for tuning in. Yeah, no kidding. That's awesome. Um, now there's a lot of ways to do a color study, but the challenge that I would put to you is to do the one that's the most uncomfortable for you. And what I find to be that people have a hard time with is because they really kind of want to get into the weeds is to limit your time. 
So I'm going to put a timer on here to doing 20 minutes. Um, let's see. Do you want me to just set it? Yes, that'd be wonderful yeah. if you could. So um, <clears throat> we're going to set a timer for 20 minutes, and I'm going to try to like get the, the thinnest gist. We can talk about maybe going longer on it, but I want you to show like how finished you can make it in 20 minutes. So I'm just gonna kinda go in quickly and add a bit of color. This is like a bit of the background color. Um, there are a lot of artists to do a lot of different ways on how they approach work, but I have found that, especially when I'm working with color studies, that if I put the largest color in first and the least priority color first, then uh, and build from there, it, I actually get a better color relationship result on the focal point of what's important. Yeah, right. for a lot of my color studies, I'll usually do background first, then occasionally I'll do Depending on the hair color, I'll usually try and get the hair in because usually I'm painting a self-portrait and I have dark hair. So I'll use my hair to mark my darkest dark. And then I'll almost always paint the skin tone last because then it's so much easier to key the value and the chroma to everything else that's around it. And it kind of just falls into place, hopefully. Yeah. That's, the, that's the goal, the goal at least. Yeah. But, you know, I've done my fair share of color studies, and that's kind of what I found works the best for me. Me too. Context matters so much, you know, and a big thing is freshness. You know, we mm -hmm. talk, Tina and I have talked a long time about, like, one of the, there's a lot of ways of doing it, and I mean, I know many, many that start with the face right away, but... The face is the one thing I want to do first, and so that's why I don't do it first. <laughs> it's kind of a carrot, you know, for uh, in front in front of me to keep going forward. Um, and let's just go ahead and pull that teal in there. Um, and so the other reason is that with the freshness, if I want. I want to make the least amount of mistakes on the most important part. So if the face is the most important part, then if I get everything around it, then the context is set, and I can paint a much more fresh portrait by making sure that I've had everything else in it taken care of and balanced. Yeah. Really quickly, can you all tell us what size panels you're working on? Hmm. Yeah, this is probably about maybe three and a half inches by four inches is what I'm thinking. Uh, very small. Uh, the, honestly, this is spare dye bond that I have cut for larger paintings that I always keep for studies. And it works great for little studies because they're already toned. They already, they already have ground and tone on them. It's like, wow, well, that, that's going to be great. So... I'll use those. Yeah, I don't I don't really know what size mine is either. It's also just a spare piece of dye bond, but I usually do my color studies in five by seven or six by six if I'm doing like a square composition. I find that that's like my perfect size for color studies. If I go bigger, then I have a tendency to be um, more tempted to add more detail. So five by seven is kind of my sweet spot. I think it's a good, um note to make that um, for those of y'all who work on panels and cut your own, um, it's a great reminder, don't toss your scraps. Mm -hmm. um, they're definitely usable for color studies like this. Yeah. My poor wife has to put up with all of my scraps all over the place. Every jar of jelly, you know, I'm like, oh, I could use that jar, you know, <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> everything has potential. And, um, you know, I, I'm always a recovering hoarder. I, I always have to watch myself. Um, so uh, she does a good job of helping me purge, too. You know, it's like, honey, you haven't used that in six years, and we're still carrying on to that takeout, Chinese takeout uh, plastic 
container that you still have. It's like, oh, okay, all right, fine, I'll get rid of it. <laughs> but I will not throw away boxes because you know how many times you can ship a painting in yeah. a box that you already have? Yep. And they're expensive. If you buy them, it's like I am never buying a box. I just refuse. So I have so many under my bed, not under my sofa. <laughs> <laughs> also, um, packing like like oh, peanuts yeah. and stuff yes. and bubble yeah, wrap bubble wrap those like eco whatever they call them um they're like a little roll of like little inflatable yes. pads yes. yeah i always yeah. keep those uh -huh. <laughs> we have kids and then they pop them yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then they just like jump on them all the time so jay's got two super cute little kids three three, three. oh that's right i haven't ever, i actually never met the third <laughs> That's incredible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> he dubbed her the boss baby. Love it. Her first word is bat. She would point. She would pick her up and say bat. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so. Love it. Boss baby. All right, we're going to put this color up at the top. His hat, which I kind of love that you're wearing a hat today. So we don't do a lot of caps here, so it's kind of fun. And what we're going to do later is do him in a split light scenario that when you put, turn the hat around, but half of his face will be lit, and then we're going to turn on a rim light. And that way it's going to like um, accentuate the hat visor because we're going to have him turn his hat to the front. So... Well, the only hat I have done that I can recall is uh, one of Evie's friends, Tucker, came in and he was wearing um, a cowboy hat, mm -hmm. a black cowboy hat, and that was a lot of fun. That was the, that's the, um, gosh, that's, I think that's the only one I can think of. I think that that's the only one I can think of. Yeah. I remember when Tucker came in with that hat, we were like, wow, we've never done a hat Wait, before. your mom. Oh, oh yeah. that's right. Yeah. She, yeah. yeah. How could I forget you my forgot mom and her mother. lovely oh, hat? Oh, my Love. God. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. I forgot my mom, everyone. <laughs> oh. Yeah, Can I think that means we might need another, another fun hat day. Yeah. Maybe for, like, Halloween. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I love it. Which hat? We could do like Santa hat for Christmas. Harry Potter the sorting hat. Oh yeah. We were talking about this over lunch, but Halloween costumes, what's everyone got planned for Halloween? I think, Evie, did you have a costume yet? Well, um, I was telling Erica, I've been meaning to dye my hair for a while now. Oh, and, nice. Um, in order to kind of finally get myself to take the time to do it. Um, I'm going to be Wednesday, Adams, even yes. though, even though Halloween's on a Tuesday. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> but, yeah. What about you, Tina? Um, so, Brian, my fiancé, we're both going to be Jack Sparrow. <laughs> so be two Jack Sparrows, um, except he has the facial hair and I do not. So I'll improvise with that. But Sharpie. Sharpie or a really bad fake mustache, oh. I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. But I realized I already have like pirate type clothes because a lot of my paintings, I'll like order things online for clothes that look relatively timeless and they can definitely be pirate outfits. So I already have pirate clothes. All of the billowy sleeve uh -huh. things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about you, Louie? Have you decided what you're going to be yet? No, I haven't. Um, it's not like you've been really busy or anything. No, I know, I exactly. <laughs> yeah. I should, I should, how dare me with <laughs> all the, me sitting on my idle hands. Um, it'll be fun, whatever it was. Last year, last year, Parisa and I went as thing one and thing two, mm -hmm. um, which was a lot of fun. But we're going to definitely do something. I'm really excited. I don't know if I've said it on the live stream yet, but one of the things that I'm really excited about is I've wanted to do this like three years in a row and we're going to make it happen this year. 
which is uh, our kids in the neighborhood, they like to, all the parents will meet up with their kids in like a parking lot uh, of like our clubhouse area. And with that, they all go trick-or-treating at once. So the first year we did trick-or-treating, we didn't know this. And, um, and we found out that like they'll just line up uh, way beforehand and then they'll come to your house and it's like major trick-or-treating for like two seconds. And then everyone gets their candy and leaves. And I was like, well, you know, there's no trickling in, no, no kids that came the rest of the night. And I kind of wanted them to like, you know, it to be a little bit more of a, an event. So this year, my wife and I ordered a ghost pinata. And we're going to fill it with candy and I'm going to put it on one of the trees in the front yard. And uh, that way the kids have like a fun game to play and they're going to all take swipes the pinata, and that, and that way at least it's like a, a you know, a 20 minute thing, and then we're gonna have like ap- spiced apple cider and stuff. Uh, yeah, so it'll be, it'll be a blast. You gonna raise a pinata? You don't want to raise it? I have a pulley uh, that, that just, believe it or not, that I was using for uh, hanging our drapery. I have like everything on pulley systems, and so I had a few extra ones, so I'm gonna put that up in the tree and use that. Well, if you see two Jack Sparrows also in the crowd hitting yeah. the pinata, don't say anything. <laughs> your, your secret's safe with me. <laughs> it's just not fair that we're considered too old for trick-or-treating. That's like, right. Like, what? Well, in my neighborhood, they have adult trick-or-treating with the kids. Oh, nice. So certain houses are known for jello shots. Wow. So the the apple cider will have a spike option, (laughs) um, so that the adults have just as much fun. You get to a stage where trick trick or treating is a production. Oh, yeah. Have to think about six costumes. Yeah. And then, am I an escort? Am I a road guard? The dog gets a costume. Oh. It's, it's a production. So the adult foster lower seat after about 15 houses of complaining. And I love it. Yeah, it's great. Well, Rosie is going to join Evie in her Wednesday oh. celebration because she has a Wednesday uh, onesie for her. Yes. Yep. <laughs> so she will be joining Evie. I'm going to have to make sure I get a photo with her. Oh, yeah. that would be the best. <laughs> Does your neighborhood do the golf cart thing? No, they don't do the golf cart oh, thing. Yeah, they, they, um, it's a pretty walkable neighborhood. Um, they have like a decent sidewalk system that goes like in, um, like there's like one major circle of, of the neighborhood and that goes for like a mile. And then there's just a few spokes that are off of it. And so people, um, it's, it's pretty easy for the kids. You know, it's not too, too hard. But yeah. I have some kids in my neighborhood, but unfortunately my driveway is so steep that a lot of the time, like even if I go all out with like lights and decorations and stuff, they don't even walk up my driveway. Oh. <laughs> So I don't know. I might just like have a little candy bowl by my mailbox or something so they yeah. don't have to walk all the way up there. <laughs> There's a house in the neighborhood. This guy puts on this massive clown costume and still... Oh, oh, no. That, yeah, not yes. going close to that house. <laughs> he has a, a hammer. It's made of foam, but it is... Oh, I mean, man. it looks like it could crush a small car hammer. I might, I might have to mic you up, Jay, so everyone can hear all of this. He sits on his porch, just sits there with a hammer across his legs, no lights on, and if you walk up, he stands up and comes towards you. And what we've learned is if you're brave enough to go up there, you get a mother load of candy. Uh-huh. Ah. But there's only a few select children that'll do it every year. So yeah. I always thought that would be fun just to have the house that... And kids come, but they got yeah. <laughs> they got to work for it. Yes, <laughs> I've always wanted to be the guy that you see like on the YouTube videos where 
He is the the scarecrow, stuffed scarecrow oh, on the porch, yeah. you know? That's awesome. Oh, and when the kids come up and blah, yeah, I totally <laughs> want to do that. Oh, and we have a fabulous new piece of sound equipment where I can make myself into a monster voice. Oh, yeah. Cool. So um, you you won't be able to hear it, but our, the audience will if if Evie wants to make herself into a monster voice. Um, yeah, because last page, time... Is the right pa page right? If you, you see the right page over there. Page right. Mm -hmm. what? Right page. Oh. And then it's that one right there. Is this a monster voice? Yes, it is. Okay, great. <laughs> here we go. Painting is serious. So you get a, a good laugh on the monster voice, and it, it sounds really great. Okay, did so. it? No, it didn't turn off. <laughs> <laughs> Just push it again. No, uh, push the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, well, let's see. We've got some more folks who have signed on that I'll read from really quickly. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. We have Monique from Massachusetts and Faye from Guilford in England. Nice. Um, we've got Esteban. Uh, repping Chile in Sweden. Hello. And we've got Ruben from Argentina. Nice. Arjit from India. And Kirsten from Norfolk, Virginia. And let's see, Esteban asks the question, I apologize if it's a basic question, but what happens if you paint with a lot of medium? I mean a layer of diluted oil painting with linseed oil. Is it okay, let's see. Is it okay to wait till it's dry and then another layer and so on? Did that make sense? Do you want yes, to it so in other words, the, his initial layer, he's putting a whole lot of linseed oil into it. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, okay. diluted oil. Diluted with uh, like diluted a- Diluted like linseed oil. Okay, yeah. so I'm assuming that that would be with like some sort of thinning solvent, um, mm -hmm. like a like a- like a Gamsol or something, which would make it a lean medium. And that's totally fine to have a lean, have a lean medium like that uh, as your first layer. If it was just, um, if it was just linseed oil, then it would be too fatty of a layer for your first layer. So it'd make it more difficult in layers to come and more difficult for it to dry. But it's absolutely okay to use um, you know, within reason, of course, you know, um, but it's okay to use, um, that lean medium that you're talking about. So I use a half and half, um, in my layers. Uh, Do you so. want to give like a super uber brief explanation of fat over lean? Yeah. So a brief explanation is. They say fat over lean because basically oil is like is a is a fat, so that's why they say fat fat over lean. And what it basically means is is that when you have paint coming out of your tube, it is as it has the least amount of oil combination to pigment relationship. And so, what they're basically saying is um, make less oil in the first few layers. Uh, and bring more oil into your later layers, um, or you can't, you're allowed to bring more oil into your later layers. So, um, so that way, the problem is, is if you have too much oil in the small layers, think about a, a brick and mortar, you know, think of the mortar as your oil and the brick as your pigment. And, uh, and what you'll realize is, um, is that if you have too much mortar and with not enough bricks, then there's not enough integrity of your, your paint to hold. And so the paint will move, the pigment will move over time underneath and it will make like not a good foundation for your scenario. So um, what happens is, is that um, if you put it in the later layers though, but you know, and there's more pigment in the earlier layers, that means there's like more bricks to oil and, and the foundation won't move on the top layer. So it'll reduce cracking happening later. If 
for some reason, while concentrating, that was really hard to explain. <laughs> Woo. By the end of October, you're going to be like the multitasking master. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, for, some, for whatever reason, that took brain power. <laughs> All right, so that's the first 20 minutes. And so you can see that I have like the basics down of like what the color relationships are going to be. Now, remember, we're not trying to make a portrait. We're just trying to get color relationships. Um, so what we're going to do is we'll take a quick few minute break and we'll, we'll keep going. I'm going to keep going one more round with this. Uh, and then what we might do in, you know, is another color study a little bit later. Does that sound good to everybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm yeah. still working on this one. I'll definitely need okay. to Yeah, and one, one more session will be good. All right, everybody, we'll see you in about five minutes.
All right, everybody, we're back. Rocking and rolling. Back at it again. Chase being a rock star up there, modeling so well. Mm -hmm. Putting up with us. Putting up with us and all of our shenanigans. Next next break, we're gonna we're gonna mic them up, um, so everybody can hear his radio voice. This is a great little spot because. The good thing about doing color studies is you can try something out and it's not going to cost you anything to do it. You know, be like, oh, let's try this. So I'm going to add a little a nice bit of red into this side shadow. Models, I don't have to worry too much about position. No, nope. mm -hmm. nope. Versus... exactly. You can talk and hang yeah. out. Yeah. Right. Gives you a friend or two that's a little easier to. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a great thing for kids to sit and try try out some stuff. Uh, Mustafa says hi from Egypt. Thanks a lot for all these great and helpful live streams. Hey, Mustafa. And Scott Jones has just joined us and is here to enjoy. Hi, Scott. Scott Jones. Hi, Scott. Good to hear from you. It's great to to hear from you, buddy. Glad you're here. Just working on some color studies. Yep. I hope my little color study that you have is in its home on That's your wall. That's right. Scott is such a wonderful supporter of all artists. Um, he has helped many, many artists get on their feet. Yep. So all the way over in... Washington, right? State I think of Washington. So, yeah. Um, I know he he has connections over in Montana too. I think he might have an extra place over there. But just glad you're with us, Scott. Yeah, Scott and I met for the first time at Portrait Society of last year, which is why I also just love going to the conferences because you get mm -hmm. to actually meet the people that you've chatted with occasionally on social media and see them in person and you're like wow you're real and not just an icon on yep. Instagram oh yay he says he's planning on visiting in January or February yay Ooh. I didn't want to say it, so that just you know, <laughs> but we're we are so excited that Scott is going to actually come down and visit, and um, you know he's going to spend some time with all of the East Oaks peeps here. Uh, he's he was so generous to say that he would come, uh, be a part of it. We might even do a little bit of live streaming stuff. So um, really looking forward to it. He's going to probably do maybe do a lecture. We're letting him decide what he wants to do because he's just so good at giving and why dictate to him when he, he can give us the best gold by knowing what he can give. Yeah, well, he has so much experience in the business side of the art world. I feel like that's crucial for artists to know. Yeah. Obviously it's important to paint, but how do you sell your paintings in order to be able to make more paintings? Um, and just as an aside, um, Arjit was wondering, Lewis, if you could share, uh, you had previously mentioned a art palette Instagram account. Um, they were wondering if you could oh. share that to the Discord at some point. Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, could y'all help remind me to make sure that happens? Yeah, I'll um, remind you. Absolutely would be happy to. Yeah. And if, for those of you who maybe haven't yet, um, the Discord for East Oaks has been a really fun kind of playground for everybody to share their projects and talk art and um, just another, you know, point of contact for us and our community. So uh, go ahead and download Discord and hop on there. We'd love to catch up and chat with y'all. So at this point, y'all are kind of finishing up these color studies. Is there anything that you are thinking about, like wanting to prioritize in these last 
in this last session or um, anything that you're finding is uh, really important information to try to like digest. Um, say, if this were a study for a larger piece and you're trying to think about, you know, how the color affects the form, yada, yada, um, what are you guys thinking about? Mm, that's such a great question, Evie, because um, I absolutely am thinking about um, the hierarchy of everything, um, hierarchy of value, hierarchy of, of um, hue, value, and chroma. Um, that's like the main reason for doing this is to be like, okay, well, what's important and making like the more important thing be the focal point and to kind of see how everything harmonizes with itself. So that is the main thing I'm thinking about. I'm like making sure that his face is like the, the in this instance, it is as well, aside from his shirt being the most mm -hmm. chromatic thing, um, the skin tone wise, that's where I want the focal point to be in his face, right? And so um, everything is going to be a little bit lower than than that, you know. Um, and I'm already fussing way too much in the face for a color study. So I'm going to um, Me too. Stop. Don't say that. I'm going to continue <laughs> to do it. Um, but I am trying to make sure that there's value relationships that um, are being established. So like making sure that the side, the far side of the hat is like the darkest dark um, on this piece. And that gives me more range when I'm working on other parts of it. Yeah, and I'm also asking myself, what am I necessarily wanting to change? Like I might be seeing this very bright blue hoodie in front of me. Um, and I could definitely paint it that way, but I'm also thinking of how can I maybe possibly neutralize it in some areas and just playing around with color. Um, so I've kind of neutralized the right side of the hoodie just so it kind of makes the more chromatic side a little bit more important. Um, whereas if I had it all super chromatic, it might be a little bit distracting from mm -hmm. his face and the whole painting. So making notes of things like that that I want to change for when I would theoretically do a full-size painting of this. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I've never painted a blue quite like this before. It's not usually I in, know, my <laughs> right? in my arsenal. But it's fun. Yeah, it's just tons of fun. Um, there, was, there was one time a few weeks ago, I was trying to mix a blue for a painting I was working on, and I think I mixed probably like four different times, and I just like could not get it. And finally, I had to go to Lewis and ask, hey, do you have any thalo green? Because I don't know what else to do. Or no, it wasn't thalo green. It was, um, oh gosh, was it thalo blue with, with titanium in it? What was it? Um, Sometimes it's just like... I feel you like can't it was get the right blue. thing unless you have the right thing. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember what color that was that we're, we're trying to hit. That's one of the reasons we're doing the um, Zorn palette, but then the Tailing the Primaries Day, because... I've been really interested in, in, for the fun of it, trying the most primary colors that that I think are out there at the moment, which are cobalt teal, lemon yellow, and quinacridone, quinacridone magenta. Um, and ho hopefully, that you know, as far as mixing colors is concerned, that they're supposed to be the ones that can give you the largest range, but the problem is, is when you have the largest range, it's like, um, you know, it's like riding a crazy wave. You gotta be, you gotta mm -hmm. know how to balance all of those things. So doing like a neutral painting using those crazy colors, I think would just be such a fun exercise. Yeah, and tomorrow for our Zorn painting, we have a special guest that will yes, be joining us. Yes, we do. Us. So, I don't know, should we, should we wait until everyone finds out? 
You have to tune in to see who it is? Yes, let's do right. that. Um, you have to tune in to find out who our special guest is. So, um, and he or she is a lot of fun to be around. Mm -hmm. So, um, we have a couple of guests coming that are outside of, that are part of the East Oaks family, but don't necessarily come every day to um, our studio. They have their own studios that will be coming in. So, looking forward to that. Uh, let's see. Jump Piero says, hi from Milan, Italy. Hello. And uh, Sam McElmore asks, I've never used lead paint, so I don't know how much about them. Would white lead change color over time? What are the benefits of lead white over titanium white? Ooh. Well, there's a lot. By the way, Sam is going to be one of our newest East Oak Studio family members Ooh. here. Yay! Really excited about her, her coming in. A round of applause. Yeah, give her a round of applause. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let me see if I can get the right. <laughs> is it this? It's, oh gosh, it's on that it's on that page one. No, that's not it. <laughs> what is that? There it is. <laughs> well, after giving her crickets and a wah 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 wah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't know these. Uh, <laughs> that was now great. I have a robot voice. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Sorry. Okay. No. Nope. Okay. There we go. There you go. There you <laughs> I go. Can't do this. <laughs> you shouldn't allow me anywhere near <laughs> these buttons. No, this is the best. We need this, you yeah. to do this all the time. <laughs> I guarantee you everyone is thoroughly entertained right oh now. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, Sam, we're so excited for you to come in. <laughs> <laughs> Not crickets and trombone. No. We really no. are very excited about you coming. <laughs> yeah, one of these days I'll learn my way around these sound effects. Um, it is a bit new, so thanks for having patience with me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so good. We're planning on adding more. I just there's there's so many things that I've been trying to get ready and do for this live stream that um it just wasn't the priority. Yeah. We should definitely get some oohs and ahs in there though. Oh, absolutely. If we, if we could record that ourselves, it'd be even better. <laughs> How fun would that be? That'd be a lot of fun. How much time do we have left in this um Y'all have 12 minutes. Oh, great. 12 and a half. Um, but yeah, Sam, back to your lead white question. Mm. Oh, of um, course. Gosh. I'm so, no, you're good. <laughs> go for it. Uh, Evie, if you want to, if you have thoughts there, I mean, sure. I can go, I can dive right in, but if you have thoughts, you're welcome to. Well, that's something we actually talk about fairly frequently in, in studio um, is the way that titanium white uh, tends to do something called flashing. Um, which lends sort of a dull, um, less vibrant uh, effect. Um, that's kind of like the, the white version of paint, like sinking in almost. Um, it can throw off some of your color harmonies and stuff uh, after you use it. So one of the benefits of lead is that it doesn't do that. Um, and it has... Uh, typically a different consistency, um, depending on what, what carrier oil you have. And also it does tend to be more vibrant and, um, I don't know, it's just, it's, I find it creamier in texture. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah, Tina, Lewis, do you guys want to add anything to that? Yeah. Or Tina, how about you go first? Yeah. I was also going to add, it dries a lot faster than titanium, which I really like because I can work on the first layer of a painting and get it all in and the next day it'll be totally dry unless I use like super thick paint or something um, but it's also the tinting strength is a lot lower so like titanium um, I remember I was at Portrait Society and I was buying my first tube of lead white and the woman there called titanium a sledgehammer which is really accurate because it mm -hmm. just like gives tons of um, tinting strength but it's not always how much you'd like, um, whereas lead white has more of a softer tinting strength, which I really like, and I haven't used titanium in a year, so I've gone to the dark side. That's right. The final reason, if no one said this, um, is 
the longevity of your, it is the most stable pigment in the painting world. So if you mix it with any other paint color, it makes that paint color more stable too. So the longevity of your painting is very high when you are using titanium or uh, lead white. So, and it has, y'all mentioned this, which is it has a bit of a, a transparency to it. So it has mm -hmm. a marble effect um, where it, the translucency of it um, helps with making the, the paint feel more vibrant, which oil, one of the reasons we paint with oil is because of its transparent nature and how light refraction happens with it. So it helps with the aiding in the light refraction. Yes, just wash your hands after you use it. Make yeah. sure you're being very cautious with it. And yeah, don't eat a sandwich. Fun. Don't eat a sandwich right afterwards without washing your hands. Yeah, or wash your hands. What I do is wash my hands and then I eat my sandwich in the bag still so I don't physically yeah. touch the sandwich yep. <laughs> just to be safe. Um, Arjeet asks, at what stage do you think of color temperature? In a, a normal painting or a color study? I'm assuming a, a normal painting. I was assuming color study, mm. but I guess you can answer that however you wish to. I mean, I'm immediately thinking of color temperature in, in a color study, um, just just due to making sure that everything's sinking. Um, so, uh, for example, like in the face, in the shadow, there's there's like these fabulous warm notes that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what happens is you put down something, you think it's chromatic, but then you start putting stuff around it and you realize you can push it more. So a lot of times I'll be just pushing things more and more in my, um, in, in the temperature and um, chroma range, so. Yeah, I'll usually kind of put in a vague idea of what I think the skin tone will be and then I'll go in like what I'm doing right now is adjusting the color temperature a little bit I'm adding more cool notes um, around the warm areas so it's just a easier way for me to kind of organize my thoughts because um, I tend to get a little a little overwhelmed when I have to think of all those things all at once so I'll kind of do them in phases uh, and the good thing about a color study is that it's so workable so you can jump between areas with no problem. Yep. But the reflected light on his face, like on his chin from that hoodie is really cool. Yeah, it is. Isn't and it? hitting like <clears throat> the beard, which mm -hmm. is like 10 times more light refracting, I feel like hitting all those little hairs. This is a, this is a cool little painting. Yeah, man. Joan asks, what is the ideal sharpness for an edge? I recall reading in an art book, I'm not sure if it was by Sargent or Soroya, that an edge is never as sharp as we think it is. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, edges, man, that can make or break a painting. Um, the, as far as I, I would agree with, with them, that you have to think about yet again, a hierarchy. Of course, we're not working with edges necessarily in this. Um, you know, this is more about the color study, but, um, but when, I'm, when you're working with the hierarchy of edges, I, I think of a couple of things. What is the focal point and what is the most forward thing in the painting? And what is the most round thing and what is the most sharp thing? And those are what I use to help gauge um, how soft or hard edges, hard of edges I make in my painting. Um, also, things like hair, I tend to make very soft uh, when that's a big pitfall for people to make very hard. Um, another big pitfall for people to make very hard edges is irises. They tend to like make want to make the edges super hard, but you, I find the most inspiring paintings have very soft edges on their irises. Um, so to keep those things in mind, that helps bring the eyelid forward um, when you're working on the painting. 
I'm going to finish out this little dark area over here so that I can just, in case that alarm starts going off on me. Yeah, how, how much? Time? Five minutes. Oh, okay. Perfect. Now, you know, some people will tell you spend only five minutes on a color study, you know, or 10 minutes, no, no longer than five or 10 minutes so that you're just getting the, the big look and the big picture. And then there's other people that, like I said before, you know, get much more involved with them. And so really you have to decide what, what you want it to be about and what's important for you. And there's really no wrong way as long as you're using it as an opportunity opportunity to investigate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some people are slower at painting than others and some people are faster. So don't think that just because you can't do a 20 minute color study um, in 20 minutes doesn't mean that you're not necessarily doing it right. Maybe you're just a little bit slower of a painter, which I think I am, so. Also, if you're having fun, who cares? Yeah. If you're having a blast doing it, keep doing it. Exactly. You might make a little bitty gem. And look, there, there, there were Russian miniaturists back in the day, and I have a huge respect for the miniaturists back in the day because they would make paintings for the soldiers so that they could have a picture of their loved one mm. on, near their chest while they were in battle. I didn't know that. Yeah. And I mean, they would use it as any traveling thing. So if you were traveling anywhere, you would usually mm -hmm. take a miniature and they were painted on ivory. And they're the most beautiful little gems and they're about this size, you know, and they would make them like perfect, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and then, you know, if you wanted to, I mean, uh, Messonnier would paint half the size of a face of this and have it completely rendered out. And it was just gorgeous. Like some of my favorite paintings are Messonnier paintings. Um, of like military men on, you know, soldiers that were like rounding the troops. And uh, they're just absolutely fabulous to look at. And painting small is so hard, so yeah. difficult, especially when it comes to faces. So hats off to them. Jeez. Yeah, and each face looks totally different. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just like, I've pulled it up for Tina before, some of the mm -hmm. ones I've seen that are in museums, and I was just like, what? You know, they're amazing. Yeah. You need like those glasses that surgeons use for like yeah, brain yeah, surgery. Exactly, you know? loops. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, I keep stealing my wife's loops. <laughs> my wife is a hygienist, and she has oh. a pair. I don't actually keep and steal them. No, uh, I was, but, oh, okay. But, I was yeah, say. she she wears them. She um, she's a dental hygienist, and so in order to oh. not strain her back, she uses um, they're called loops. <laughs> the first time she told me she needed to buy some loops, I was like, "What the heck are you talking <laughs> yeah. about? Loops? Like like earrings?" <laughs> Such a guy Oops. comment. No, honey, those are hoops. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to figure out why they're different. Why are they different? Hoops. Love me a pair of hoops. This is the fun part for me. I like just like doing little swoops. Swoops, swoops, and swoops. Loops. Swoops and hoops and loops. This is your opportunity to test colors. You know, so if you're, if you're more of a colorist where you love to push color in yours, this is, this is your chance to test something mm -hmm. new, to test, test a different color and see how it works with the rest of them. See if you can find something harmonious. Also a good chance to play around with composing at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, as everyone online can see, um, Lewis and Tina have two very different compositions. And I believe it was our very first East Oktober 
session where um, we talked last Monday about um, kind of using your fingers as a viewfinder and, and composing. Um, mm -hmm. So this is another great example of that. see yeah how are we my doing? alarm is going off in five seconds so okay. i'm gonna like oh gosh yeah all right cancel go ahead that, and so cancel that so, yeah ears. um all and right. with that we're gonna take another quick break and we'll be back shortly and Thanks we'll be everyone. changing uh before you, you go out evie we're gonna be changing the lighting and doing another color study so um so that's what we'll be doing so that you can get two different um um situations, settings. So, mm. all right, everyone, we'll be back. Thank you.
All right, everybody, we're back. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, do a split light on Jay and put the rim light behind him like we had at the beginning. And uh, we had him turn his hat around and we had him take his hoodie off. So now he has this warm uh, T-shirt on. And that way we have a whole nother set of, of um, variables change on us so that we can try something new. And I recommend doing this if you have a model just to test things out and see uh, what you like. So let me go over here and get in front of all these different cameras. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, there, yeah, they're they're a, a different Kelvin temperature. Okay. The Kelvin. The question for everybody is, uh, why do I use like white light or yellow light? And uh, basically, they're different Kelvin temperatures. Um, so Kelvin goes from, I think, eight thousand to 1,000, and what sunset usually is roughly around like 2,000, and our incandescent lights are usually around 3,000, uh, so the warm, like super warm, and then they go up to about 5,600 is probably the, like a really white cloudy day, like a bright cloudy day, and so uh, if you go to 6,000, that's like blue sky. And so it's to help mimic maybe more of a natural light, nice. but also you can calibrate your cameras accordingly to the Kelvin. So these lights, that would be more like a 5600 Kelvin, and this light it would be more of about a 4,800 to 5,000 Kelvin. So, um, Was that a consideration when you're painting your light source? Yeah, uh, because like, for example, I have a warm light coming from you on the side, but the rim light I have is cool, so it helps create a little bit more dimension. And it also informs the viewer that there's two different light sources doing two different things. So um, so now I'm gonna just like check and see if I even, because I kind of like this light on it too, don't you, Tina? What do you yeah, think? Yeah, I'm curious to see how it would look with it off. Let's see but. what it looks like with it off. Very dramatic. Ooh. Yeah. Mm. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Yeah? I think I like this. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. We're going to do this. And um, how about you, like, lean forward a little bit more if you can. Yeah, just like that and see what that looks like. And then pull the, pull his, this light source in front of him just a touch more. What's that like, Tina? Hmm, that's nice. Mine is the, what's it called when I'm facing the oh, short light side? Yeah, I got the short light Yeah, you side. got the short light. Is that good enough? Oh, yeah. Okay. It'll be interesting if I have a painting. Okay, like cool. So Tina has the short light. You have the broad light, Lewis. Mm -hmm. And the light itself is a demonstration of half light and rim light. Split light. Mm -hmm. Split light. Okay. Mm -hmm. But half light, I mean, honestly, it, yeah. the terms don't matter as much. It's more about knowing what the light lighting effect is happening. Mm. And if it were to be truly broad light, I would need to be probably about four more feet to the left. Mm -hmm. So, because it's like 50-50 where I am, but where it's almost, I would have to be more like right here. Gotcha. Um, so, but in this instance, that looks that looks really good. You good with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, we're gonna get started on a, on a whole nother scenario. Now, this is really interesting because what's happening now is that the background is mm. even lighter than it was before in relationship to him, which is a lot of fun. Um, so I might just go in here and just maybe make a little pile of of what color I want to do. I'm just going to take uh, ultramarine blue and oxide red and make a nice warm neutral. A little bit of violet in there, so I'm going to just add a touch of violet 
in there Are as well. Are we doing glasses on? Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, no, you're good. You yeah, oh, whichever think, you want. I'm, I'm cool. I see <laughs> <laughs> you're like, oh, all of a sudden I can see things. <laughs> Everything's so clear. Yeah. Evie, everything looks in focus, right? It looks great. And Lewis, are you using any medium right now, or are you going paint only? Uh, at, while I'm mixing, it's only paint, but I will probably add just a just a hint of lean medium, uh, you know, which I usually is half linseed, half uh, Gamsol, or in this instance, I'm using um, the Chelsea Classical Studio lean medium right here. So. Nice. What about you, Tina? Um, I am using a mixture of the lavender spike oil from Chelsea Classical Studios and a little bit of their linseed oil, which I so I basically made my own lean medium. It's basically what I did. So like 50-50 mix, just a little bit of it to give the paint a little bit more, um, more just a thin, yeah, a little more oomph, so it spreads easier. Very technical terms. Yeah. To make them we use very technical terms here, like, you know, draggy bits and oomph. <laughs> um, you know, helps people know exactly what we're talking about. Oh, yeah, what can I say? We're professionals. Yeah, right? professional. Scalp, scalpel-like uh, technical terms, yeah. you know. Very precise. The sharp cutty thing? Yeah, the sharp cutty <laughs> thing, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm going to do my color study horizontal. Ooh, I'm it give up. it a bit of a cinematic feel. Very video. cinematic. I love it. That's the reason for having like two people doing the live stream is because I love that we're like changing up what we're doing mm -hmm. from each other. It's really nice. Uh, we've got Julia joining from sunny California. And we've got Deirdre from Ireland. Hello. Cool. And um, we've got Alda from South Africa. Nice. It's awesome to see people from all over the world coming in. We've got Claudia from Argentina. Welcome, welcome. Yes, welcome all. All right, how am I going to do the structure on this one? I'm going to do a much closer on the face on this one. Uh, Paul was wondering, what are the dark colors on the lower left of your palette? Um, I guess that could apply to either of y'all. Yeah. If both yeah. well, I guess want we'll to explain. Take turns. Yeah, you do yours, and <laughs> um, I'll do mine. So the ones that I have, these down here, I don't know if you can see, but I don't. Yeah. I'm not using these. This is like a purple, and this was ivory black. This is ultramarine blue, cobalt blue, and transparent oxide red. Those are my three darkest. And my uh, darkest are uh, ultramarine blue, oxide red, and uh, ivory black. Did you say ivory black too? I have like I just had little, it once, yeah. but I haven't used it in years, so it's just a sad little pile <laughs> that I haven't scraped off. I really like using ivory black with yellow to make uh, neutral green mixtures. Mm, I haven't tried that. I haven't used ivory black in years. I usually just mix my darks with ultramarine blue and uh, transparent oxide red. Well, then tomorrow on the live stream, you should be in the background participating, <gasps> using I'll ivory be, black for the Zorn palette. I'll be switchering and painting. At the same time. And sound effects. Yes, and sound effects <laughs> all at the same time. Easy. You got this. And you're like, ah, yeah, piece of cake. <laughs> I feel like now the background with that different colored shirt, it looks more purple. It doesn't it? Yeah. I, I, I put a lot of violet in uh -huh. mine. Yeah, for that same reason. So crazy. I got to be careful because the size of his face that I'm making this one, because I'm doing, I'm going much larger. Oh, you're larger, going real close. Is... Um, gonna tempt me to put a whole lot of information in yeah but luckily the limited amount of time that i have will help me not get too crazy 
Yeah, I was like, well, why not? If you're going to change to being horizontal, I might as well go close up. <laughs> Keep things interesting. Yeah. Keeping everyone on their toes. Who knows what we're going to do next? Yeah, better watch out. World, here we come. <laughs> this is just so high stakes, you know, it's very very dramatic and dangerous what we're doing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're going to We're going to Wait, what was that? So wait till I get that corset. No, that's right. <laughs> Jay asked what he should wear, and I told him a corset. Corset. That's the word. Oh yeah, the corsage is the flower. Yeah. Yep. That would have been, yeah, been fun different. too. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I was down. A little flower on yeah. your wrist. There you go. That'd be a nice little accessory. He goes, he, I said, of course, and he's like, ha ha, very funny, really, what do I need to do? And I was like, well, it really doesn't matter because you're going to be modeling nude. <laughs> and and uh, so, I knew that yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> but you're like, ha ha. Which is worth three layers. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I'll, I'll, I'm fine being nude un, under my clothes. <laughs> <laughs> everywhere I go. Exactly. All right, we're going to put this color down here so I can make some more real estate. Scott has some very poignant thoughts that he shared with us. He says, I have an entire home office filled with color studies, drawings, and sketches. Mm -hmm. I love spontaneity in color and composition. I honor and respect them as part of the studio process. Oh, Same with plain. That's awesome. We love to hear that. Thank you so much, Scott. That's awesome. It is amazing. It's nice to hear someone talk about art in a respectful way because I feel like as artists, sometimes we forget how much people can actually treasure these things. Mm -hmm. And I have a tendency when I don't like my painting, I'll just treat it like a piece of trash or something. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's nice to know that there are people that genuinely really care for what we do even though we may not sometimes. We can always uh, kind of abandon the sanctity of yeah. <laughs> anything we're doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, Honestly, it's good to have community for that reason, too, because, you know, I always think about, like, Edna Mode on, on uh, The Incredibles, where yeah. she's like, she's like, pull yourself together. You're Elastigirl, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Kind yeah. of like making sure that like when, when any moment we're like down and out about our stuff here, we're like, all right, pull yourself together. You're good. This is amazing. Just keep going. Yeah, definitely. It's really easy to get in your own head and think that everything you make is bad. I love seeing or like thinking of color studies as sort of an, an artifact object of mm. the art making process. And I think sometimes they can end up being their own you know, sort of mini piece or composition mm -hmm. of themselves. And sometimes it's just like a little nugget um, that you kind of get to like, I don't know, cherish as like a little reminder of like, oh, this is where I began. This is where mm -hmm. this painting embarked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And most of the time they're so cute and small and you know how cute like little objects are. It's like a mini painting. So adorable. It's like the stocking stuffer version of a painting. Yeah. <laughs> well, that actually brings up a point that all of, a lot of what we're doing here will be part of our studio sale that mm -hmm. will be happening in November. So shameless plug for everyone. If you have enjoyed what we're making, some of this stuff will be up for sale for stocking stuffers as well as uh, full size paintings because we'll be doing a final three-day painting mm -hmm. um so um keep that in mind yeah. you know there will be no shortage of paintings coming out of this challenge so nope we will be filled to the brim with paintings please and on top oh. of that you su you support all of the girls here at east oak studio yeah. uh as well as myself so Mm. Alyssa asks a good question. She says, I've always wondered why some painters leave their paint to dry on their palette in big piles and others clean off their palette completely after each session. Do you have any personal thoughts or preferences? Ooh, 
Hmm. Well, I think it's a personality trait hmm. um, of people. You know, not to say that it, you know, is fully de defining, you know, um, of who they are. But um, I can't stand like the little mountain monsters that that build up. And because I paint vertically, I don't know if it would really work well because I couldn't eventually end up closing my um, Edge Pro. But um, I don't think that it, I think some people actually use it as, I don't know, kind of a badge of honor of, of like saying, hey, this is, you know, I've been doing this a while, you know, it's like a track record kind of thing. And then I know some people that wait till it gets to a certain height and then they, um, We'll scrape it off, like Jason Bolden, a friend of mine. He'll he'll wait a couple of years until it gets to a certain height, and then and then he just will scrape it down. It's kind of a reset. But what do you think? I usually well, I'm using a wood palette, so I feel like that kind of differentiates a little bit from glass um, because with the wood you can't scrape it off as easily. So I'll usually leave my piles on there until it, it creates kind of like a good film layer so that way I can use my razor and scrape it off without damaging the wood. So I'll use usually just leave a few piles but I also hate when they get really big and like I don't like how they look on my palette so I usually scrape them off but um, with wooden palettes you do have to make sure that you clean it after every use and like with glass you can leave it on and then scrape it when mm -hmm. it's dry but with Wooden palettes, you can't do that because it will kind of always reside on your palette. And for me personally, um, I also use a glass palette and um, to position it vertically, um, which is more convenient while you're painting from life um, and also just painting in general. Um, leaving a little bit of a pile on kind of helps uh, provide something for the paint to sort of stick to and give it a little traction. So it doesn't slide down the glass. Um, so I always leave like a little bit on there for it to kind of hold on to. I think mostly it just is, you know, for many people, a matter of personal preference. Yeah, I don't think past that point it has any strat strategic reason. Mm -hmm. Uh, Paul asks if y'all have any thoughts on portraits straight on, oblique, profile, or turned away. So like orientation of the face. Hmm. If we have any thoughts on them? Yeah, or I guess um, if you have any proclivities towards one or the other, or um, yeah. Oh. What do you guys tend to gravitate towards? I love a side profile. I really mm -hmm. do. And that's something that I didn't really realize until I continually saw myself painting uh, side profiles. And I had to stop myself from doing that because that was just a natural inclination of something that I really like. Um, so I'm trying to transition to a little bit more like three quarters and full face. Um, so I like them all. I just think I naturally gravitate towards side profiles. And I would say just the opposite for me. I, I, that's like the least one I gravitate towards is a side profile. In fact, when we were when I was getting ready to uh, paint at the paint off, I was like, you know, just in case we have a side profile mm -hmm. scenario, I might need to practice that up a little bit. So, um, but yeah, I would say that it's, I don't have anything against it. I just uh, my tendency is to lean. In a different direction. Mm -hmm. I love me a good quarter, three quarter turn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's probably my favorite. Do you guys you have any? Like. Oh, sorry. That's all. I was about to say that I agree with you. I think I enjoy a good three quarter turn myself. What about lighting styles that we discussed and are working with? Are there any that you are particularly drawn towards, or any that you're kind of like, no, that doesn't necessarily interest me as much? Hmm. Well, I probably don't do a lot of what we're doing now, which is like the half light or the split light. Um, I've never done a painting in this lighting, I don't think. I like to do butterfly or the Rembrandt triangle. 
I think is the one, the two that I really enjoy. Yeah, I would say this is the same for me, typically. Um, you know, uh, there, there's absolutely times where I'll do the Van Dyke Z a lot too, uh, but with kids, I find that butterfly lighting really is complementary to, mm. to them because um, they have soft features and then Rembrandt is complementary to them as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I tend to do those more than others, but I do all of them typically. Um, because sometimes it will depend on the environment that they're in, you know, because I, ha I have to paint um, according to whatever they have in their house, you know, that mm -hmm. might, that, that plays a role. So. All right, so th this is where I am going to try to use just bigger brushes to not get like caught up in too many of the details and to just kind of put swaths of paint down because my drawing, my draftsman side of me wants to like render everything out and try to get all the structure down because it's a decent size. No, so no. I'm gonna like have to um, hold, hold the reins back a bit. Put down large swaths of paint. So tell us what you're working on. Please, we'd love to know that you are uh, painting along with us. Is it a still life? Is it a is it a portrait? Are you doing a master copy? Mm. What's going on in your friend, world? Or maybe you're painting yourself. Switch over to a brush with a little more integrity so I can pick up more paint. All of the colors on this painting are ones that I'm not used to painting. Like I wouldn't necessarily, for my work, choose these colors, you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. So it's like, hmm, how do I handle this? more challenging than I thought, but. This is know. good, yeah. good practice, yeah. facing those fears. <laughs> well, it's only fair. I like color studies. I knew I should have prepared myself. This was too easy. Yeah. <laughs> should have known. Um, and for anybody that's joining late um, who missed our previous explanation of these different lighting styles, um, you are going to be able to rewind the video and rewatch the beginning um, after the live stream is complete. Yeah, good reminder. Scott asks, if the figure is turned slightly away, three quarters or even from the back, does it make it more of a figurative piece versus a portrait? In my gallery experience, that is sometimes important in terms of sales. Mm. Mm. It's a good question. It is a good question. Um, as far as like technical terms concerned, I'm, I don't know uh, if there is a exact ter terminology answer, but I would call that more of a figurative piece um, where someone's turned away from the viewer more. 
And you're absolutely right. I think that often people, so often will associate people looking at the viewer as a more of a portrait. Mm -hmm. And there are there are instances where I would say that it it becomes very poetic and artful, um, where you could have someone look in the viewer. So it always depends, but absolutely, I think um, it it lends itself to being a, uh, more potential to being a poetic piece that isn't about the identity of the person as much as it is about the it as a work of art when it is a um, someone who's not looking directly or is turned away from the viewer. Yeah, I'd be curious to know, I don't know if Scott would be willing to answer this, but how does the different, like, whether it's a portrait or a figure, how does that differentiate the sale? Like, are they more likely to purchase it if it was a portrait, or are they more likely to purchase it if it was considered a figurative piece? I don't know if this is um, necessarily true or not, but I have heard um, from several folks previously that um, in terms of sales with portraits, um, it's a good strategy for artists to not necessarily name their portrait after their model mm. because then it depersonalizes them from the viewer, which is kind of psychologically interesting. Um, I don't know if any of y'all have thoughts out there on that. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Um, hmm. You know, while people are typing in their thoughts, um, I had an experience much younger where I did a landscape piece and I almost titled it The Location and then I decided to title it something very different that was just more of a pensive title. And um, the viewer who bought it, uh, the collector who bought it, um, came up to me as like, this looks just like uh, where my childhood, when like I used to walk through the woods, mm. and uh, it looks just like Georgia. And it was like Mississippi, you know? <laughs> and, and so like, uh, and then I did a seascape, not, you know, when I first got to North Carolina, and the same thing, it was at Emerald Isle, and the collectors who bought it said the exact same thing. She said they they were what they did have a beach house on the Carolina coast, but it wasn't Emerald Isle. And she's like, "Oh, it looks just like right outside of our uh, beach house." It is so you know this has I can't remember what it was like Atlantic Beach or something. You know this looks just like Atlantic mm. Beach. And uh, I was like, "Yeah, yeah, well, you know." Um, <laughs> So, so it is, yeah. exactly. It, is. it could be whatever you want it to be. And honestly, it's kind of still the same beach in a way. It's, a, you know, but um, no, I absolutely think that that's, I, in my experience, I have found that to be true. Um, I'm interested to hear other people's experiences. Like specificity in, in a title can be alienating almost sometimes. Yeah, I could, I could see that because a lot of people when they're like, wanting to buy a portrait or something, they'll be like, I don't want a painting of a stranger in my house. Like, I don't know who that person is. Mm -hmm. So, curious to know. Although I will say, I do appreciate sort of the journalistic integrity of documenting a model or a place or, you know, things mm -hmm. of that nature, but maybe not necessarily always as a title. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's such a, it's a interesting kind of interplay of how your your audience and your viewers associate to your work. Yeah. Another thing that I find funny is sometimes I'll paint Brian, my fiance, and I'll get comments I'm like, oh my God, that looks just like my brother or that looks mm -hmm. just like my boyfriend. I'm like, well, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> it's my future mine, hubs. But <laughs> I always find that funny. And then sometimes, occasionally, they'll tag the person that they're like, oh, this painting looks like you, and I'll go to their profile, and I'll be like, I can kind of see it. Mm -hmm. I just think that's fun. And just so y'all know, we've got just a few more seconds left before a break. Okay. okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm definitely been fussing a little too much on this one. So I gotta like get out of my portrait mode and just put down the paint. So, mm -hmm. all right, everyone, well, we'll be back shortly and look forward to seeing you then.
right, everyone, back. Oh, could you take your glasses oh, yeah, off? Sorry. Yeah, no, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, whoa. Um, to follow up on our previous conversation really quickly, uh, Scott said, if I hear someone tell their partner, why would I want a painting of her? That is a portrait, and that is a harder sell. Uh, <laughs> figurative, work, yeah. figurative work sells, Perfect. but it transcends being identified with the subject. I think that's a great way to phrase that. Thank you so much. Yeah. I want to like write that down is, on a sticky note and yep. slap it on my easel. <laughs> yep. Why would I want a portrait of her? It's excellent. That's a portrait then. <laughs> yep. That, there, there's few things that can define that more than that. Yep. And all the more reason why we need Scott down here to do a little lecture. Yeah. he has all the insight. He is the insight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. I'm avoiding my problems right now. Face your fears, Tuna. <laughs> so Jay, so you have context. We Tina has had a nickname since she was in high school. Since uh, second grade. Since second grade. <laughs> wow. Never mind. Since second grade. Wow. Um, of because you, you're going to have to tell the story because yeah. I can't do it justice like you can. So basically in second grade we had a pirate name project. And it was basically, you had to recreate like Long John Silver. So you had to do like an adjective, your name, and then a color or a fish or something. So my project, I was in second grade. I came up with Tiny Tina Tuna. And it just kind of stuck from there. I've been using that as like my gamer tag for like Xbox. And like, that's my Discord username. I'm Tiny Tina Tuna 2 because Tiny Tina Tuna was taken, believe it or not. It might have been me a few years ago, and just not remembering. I have no idea, or maybe there's another. Number two, that's top five, though. Yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll take it. But, and it also kind of has like another really good alliteration in there. Um, and then also just part of the Tuna nickname. Um, I was signing up for UPS for like their membership or something like that, and I guess I had a typo, and I didn't realize it, and I got mail <laughs> addressed to Tuna Figarelli. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It kind of so stuck great. from there. <laughs> I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Man. No, this is awesome. I really can't. Do you have a surname that you paint under from time to time now? I, tiny maybe I should. <laughs> is it a surname? Or surname? No. I yeah. think, yeah, is right? Sur sur I think surname just is, means... Your last name. The last mm -hmm. name, yeah. Okay. But like, a, um, oh man, what's it called? <sighs> like a... A pen name oh, or yeah. something. Mm, like, a pen kind name. Of like, that's it. Like lemony snicket, you know? Yeah. That's, like, that's cool, though. Tuna Figarelli. Yeah, it's I don't or, know or, that. Or Mark Twain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mark Twain was a pen yeah. name. All right. All right. It's the trivia question. What was his What was his real name? Can somebody, somebody yeah. know? Anybody out there know? You win the prize if you know. What's the prize? I'll try to give you the, the, the proper prize. applause. <laughs> yes, the, pro the prize is applause. Right? <laughs> the prize is applause. Anybody know Mark Twain's real name? I always wondered why anybody talks about tunas, why they coin it flavors cat's craze. Oh, yeah. Have you seen a domesticated cat in the ocean tracking down a tuna? <laughs> Thing. That's true. My cat loves salmon. She All right. prefers salmon. We got two people who got it. Let me see if I can do this right. There we go. Hey. Um, Samuel Clemens. Samuel Clemens. I had Samuel no job. Lang Langhorn Clemens. Longhorn yeah, Clemens. I had no idea. Samuel Clemens. All right. The next one is is what was Marilyn Monroe's real name? Oh, I know this one. Yeah? Yeah, I do know this I one. I actually I'll don't wait. know that one. I'll wait. Because I did a whole, in my speech class in community college, we had to write a persuasive speech, and I wrote a persuasive speech about how Marilyn Monroe did not commit suicide. Oh. And it was a great speech, but I 
had to do a lot of research on her life, so I do know that. Is that a conspiracy theory? I yes. didn't. I didn't realize really? that was a conspiracy. Yes. I, I knew. I've that, heard that as a conspiracy theory. Yeah. I thought she made had a drug overdose. That's what. Yes, but there was a lot of um, misinformation with the person who did the mm. autopsy. So I actually ended up being able to pull the official autopsy from nice. the CIA's cool. website. What? Look at yeah. you, Tuna. <laughs> <laughs> and I was able to cite that as my source. Detective Tuna. Okay, good. all right. We got Norma Jean. Norma mm -hmm. Jean. That's it. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Yep. Many, many applause. Yeah, I have to look something up on my Norma Jean. Yeah. There's a band I listen to called Norma Jean. I don't know if that's why. Yeah, I'm Could sure be. it is. Um, okay, let's see. Um, okay, Scott had one last thought. Undraped and semi-draped figures are less likely to be identified with the particular person. Counterintuitive, maybe, but that's what I've experienced. That's interesting. Hmm. Say that again, undraped or semi-draped? Undraped and semi-draped figures are less likely to be identified with the particular person. Hmm. Interesting. But if it's fully draped or fully clothed, then I guess there's more of a sense of identity. I guess that kind of yeah, I could make that. sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks for sharing all your thoughts, Scott. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. It's helping everyone. Yeah, Scott, you can join us every day if you yeah. want. In fact, we, <laughs> I'll, I'll stream live to you. You can hang yeah. out with us. How do we like phone them in? We can phone them in. The only problem is, is that the painters, I don't have the setup yet. I, I, it's on the list of things to do, but I don't have the setup yet for us to hear him. Oh. Except for Evie. Evie could hear him. Oh. Uh, I have everything else set up, but as soon as I have that set up, we're, we want to bring in guests, guests to um, talk to. That'd be fun. Like the East Oaks lead correspondence. That's right. Like that. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back up and try to answer some more of y'all's questions really quick. Um, let's see. Chris says he's working on a double commission right now. Mm. Way to go, Chris. Nice. And what is it? Just trying to progress a double commission and lose my painting nappies. I don't know if you mean like napkins or or like. Or diapers. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Some I'm gonna guess. On that. I'm gonna guess that's paper towels. Um, <laughs> and uh, let's see. Alyssa oh, says, in my painting world, I had to get a farmer to wrangle a lamb yesterday, so I could get a reference photo of a man's hand on the top of the lamb's head. The farmer was bemused. <laughs> Very I love interesting. That. Yeah, that's awesome. I want to see that painting when it's done. Yeah, that sounds me too. awesome. And Judith has shared she is painting her husband who's in the hospital bed. It's how I can paint from life in hospital. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Well, well, our thoughts are with you, Judith. Yeah. Yes. We pray for a speedy recovery for him. Mm hmm. And Julie asks a good question. Would any of these lighting styles work for lighting a still life? Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, if you did a split light uh, lighting, it's basically just a, a you know, a, a window that would mm -hmm. be next to your still life. So you absolutely would have the opportunity to have a similar light source. Um, so yeah, I mean, all around you could easily do most any of these. Um, is there supposed to be an amber or a we test just today? got a, uh, an amber okay. alert? Yeah, we just got an amber alert. Um, oh. Okay, I just want to make sure it wasn't on because we're Sorry, using our folks. phones. Um, oh yeah, it didn't go off on ours. I okay. think this probably overrides the. It's been a time with our governmental phone alerts I know, right? lately. I don't know. For those Americans out here who are turning in, uh, there was a national 
testing of some warning mm-hmm. service or something or other last week that uh, everybody's phones were blowing up. And um, my fiance was in the grocery store at the time. Oh, God. Oh, no. And he said that like the grocery store was just, just immediately like up. blaring oh, with everybody's man. phones. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, because even if your phone's on silent, like I always have my phone on silent, and it still overruled that and went off. There was a funny thing I saw on, I think it was on TikTok, but it was like, imagine everyone that's in prison that has a hidden cell phone. Like, oh, all their, man. Yeah. <laughs> all that's their phones great. are going off. <laughs> That's fabulous. What a great, <laughs> what a great thought. <laughs> that to me is like a shower thought, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, I wonder what would happen if. Man, I'm just reminded about how much fun this is. It's like I we should be doing this more often, just because it's fun. Color and, cities are yeah, the best because you're you're not having to think too hard about like getting likeness and everything. You're just getting to like experiment and push color around, and that's just I don't know, man. It's there's discovery, and I think when you're working on discovering things you find that uh, that was one of the reasons why, you, at least one of the reasons why I got into painting because like, it's fun to experiment and discover, mm-hmm. you know, explore. <laughs> it's like the artist version of playing in a sandbox. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Let me put some more ultramarine on my palette. Chris says he was actually referring to diapers. <laughs> yeah. I thought they he call was. them nappies Just, in the UK. We're gonna oh, let see. we're yeah. gonna let you tell us that. <laughs> I guess it, like in the painting, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, that's funny. funny. I think Tina was was I talking to you about this last week? Of um, we were talking about like ac- different accents. Oh and, yeah. Um, we were talking about some vernacular differences between uh, American English and UK English and, um, you know, like how you can never say cookies, they're biscuits mm-hmm. and just, you know, silly little things like that. Yeah, we were talking about that not too long ago. Um, like chips or fries, mm-hmm. like fish yep. and chips. So as you guys are kind of getting going and really starting to capture more of a likeness um, on these color studies, is there a thought process behind, especially doing a color study for a portrait such as this, are you thinking about capturing the likeness or like constructing the face or anatomy, or are you really just thinking in terms of shapes, blocks, color, temperature, light, shadow, that's it. Um, I'm not thinking about likeness. I'm thinking about like what you said, like shapes, the value, how the hues relate to one another and how the values relate to one another. Um, I try and tell myself if I'm aiming for likeness, then I'm doing it wrong. And I'm doing too much for a color study because that's what the big painting is for mainly. Um, I do like my color studies to look a little bit more um, 
polished in a way where, and I don't mean like it'll be like a full mini painting, but I'll spend like an extra hour on it, just tweaking a few things, making sure like the drawing is making sense for the main thing. Like if there's hands involved, I wanna make sure that the hands are the right size, the shoulders are the right size, um, just because I like to sell my color studies, so I want them to look a little bit nicer. But I wouldn't necessarily say that that's the goal. What about you, Louis? Uh, I would say the same. I'm, I'm kind of having fun, and I find myself, uh, I feel like just my tendency and subconscious wants to try to like push a little bit of a likeness just because the shapes of the shapes there, but that's not my goal, um, is to push the likeness. And anytime I feel like that I'm getting close to doing that, I have to keep, I don't know, um, pushing that out of my head a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because um, I'm, I'm really thinking about exactly what you're saying, planes uh, and shape is more of what I'm thinking about, and color, obviously, hue and chroma and value. and the relationships between those two, or three, or five, or 20. Yeah, and when I do my color studies, I always keep them up next to me while I'm doing the actual painting. Um, and most of the time, I'll be referring to the color study more than I'll be referring to my reference image because I've already done all the work. And I know that the color study is my little cheat sheet for what I need to do. And then I'll just refer back to the reference image for like the drawing issues and like um, just edges maybe, but I'm mainly referring back to my color study. What's that saying that we always do? A color study is key or Aww. color study is king? Yeah. It's either key or king. I can't I remember. I think, yeah, I think we do it interchangeably. <laughs> the fact that I can't remember that maybe shows that I need to do more color studies. <laughs> Yeah, and if anybody out there has color studies in the past that they would like for us to take a peek at, um, we would love to see them if you want to post them to the Discord. Mm -hmm. Yes, that would be awesome. Yeah. We'll be posting these on Discord too so that way you can see maybe like a closer up view of it than on the cameras that we have. We have some exciting things planned for November about color studies. Mm. I'm really excited about. Should we tell them? You should. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, Kelly's going to be telling it too. So. Um, I'm going to be teaching a color study lecture through East Oaks. So I'll be going over like the history of color studies, why you should do color studies, um, and I'll also be showing some examples of previous color studies that I've done. I've also been thinking of maybe doing a small demo or maybe we could do like a part two where I do a demo of a color study. Um, so yeah, keep on the lookout for that. I'm really excited about it. As you should be. I love color studies. I'm so glad I started doing them when I got here. Yeah, that was the first thing. We, we've said it uh -huh. before on the live stream, but that was the first thing Tina did when she got here is we had her work on some color studies using different other artists as like a master copy, but mm -hmm. um, instead just doing the color study, which is what we'll be doing all week. Mm -hmm. So um, speaking of while we're working on these things, um, tomorrow, go ahead and start looking for a more vibrant painting that you would want to do with the Zorn palette. The whole idea is not just to paint with the Zorn palette. There are plenty of people out there painting with Zorn palette, but we want you to push the color as far as it can go. That's, that's the goal. Um, so I really want to see what people come up with. Um, but no, looking forward to, looking forward to that. Seeing what, where that goes. Mm -hmm. Are we still going to have some of the ones that we chose for them to pick from? Yes, okay. we're going to have if if like when in doubt, 
and I'll actually need help with that later yeah. today. <laughs> uh, speaking of. <laughs> <laughs> now that we're um, on the topic. Yeah. Um, now that you've said that, <laughs> um, yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll have six images that we've picked um, that you know you or our guest for tomorrow will be picking from. And so that way if you can't, maybe if you don't have time to look up images that you want to work from, we'll have six that we already pre-selected. You know, I just probably should just take this eye out to keep it a color study. I'm like Taking sitting here trying to put an out. eye on, <laughs> yeah. oh gouging your eye out. <laughs> Good Lord. Well, it is Halloween, you know, like I'm just trying to stay thematic here. And just so y'all know, um, you've got three minutes left for the session. Oh, man, okay. I might as well give him an eyebrow. <laughs> he doesn't have any eyebrows in the ones I've done. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Keep your eyebrows still. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> At least now you know you look great if you shave them off one day. I burned them off once. Oh. <laughs> family vacation, I started a grill and... <gasps> Oof. There, there might have been, you know, a firework incident in there somewhere as a kid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I can neither confirm nor deny. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> banned from fireworks? <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I. But it, I, uh, I should be. <laughs> yeah. I, I've been banned. There are no fireworks in my house. I had one firework incident, and that was the only one. Kelly was waiting. She, I even had an extra one, and she went in and cut the wig off. And then put it back in the cabinet. So <laughs> oh, that's still great. There, but it's unserviceable. She cut the wick off. She didn't even throw it out. She no, cut the wick off a, and left it, a, it there. It's a, yeah, that's a permanent message. <laughs> we, we, we Never. <laughs> that's great. The, the, I bought this firework thing and lit it off, but right as it was lighting, it fell over mm -hmm. and it shot all these mm. bomb color pellets mm. at the house and at me. It's awesome. Oh my that God. sounds amazing. So her, her version of the story. Is yeah, her version. Than mine. <laughs> yeah, of course. I'm like, sure. Yeah, I was like that old, you know, those Vietnam movies where you get the old salty gummy with no shirt on standing in a fire fight yelling at everybody, get up, you'll be fine. <laughs> she was literally throwing the kids into the front door oh. of the house. All right, Evie, just give us a couple extra minutes there. Go, keep going. I'm, I'm loving the story. It's because of the story yeah. that uh, I, I'm still, asking. Time stood still for me. That all the fireworks were moving in slow motion. Jack was screaming at the top of his lungs, but he was frozen in a frozen state as they were zooming by mm. in slow motion for me. But Kelly had a completely different version of the story. Well, at, after the break, I will I will tell. I will tell my firework story, and uh, we can we can compare notes. <laughs> All right, I say since I'm having so much fun, and there's a few more things I want to do. You want to do another session or a little extra session on this? Yeah, next one? I could do like a short one because if I yeah. do a full twenty minutes, I'll say, get too involved. Right. How about ten minutes? Yeah, we'll do an extra ten minutes after this is all said and done. Uh, we'll be back in just a bit. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, that'll be that'll be perfect because. Mm. Five minutes and then 10 minutes, that'll put it at 4.30-ish. Oh, nice.
All right, everyone. Final, final bit. Final 10 minutes. So in these last 10 minutes, if y'all have any questions that you still want to ask that haven't been answered, uh, feel free to go ahead and shoot them in the comments and I'll try to get those answered for you. This like cold highlight, I'm digging. I want to do, I want to do a I definitely do a painting with rim light like this. Mm. I love the cold rim light given how warm the t-shirt is and mm -hmm. how much yeah. it's warming up the skin tone too. It's really nice. But you could definitely like push a cool rim light situation to be kind of like that spooky vibe, you know? Oh yeah, yeah totally. So when y'all are working on color studies, do you tend to find that you typically gravitate more towards using larger brushes or do you allow yourself to use whatever variety you feel inclined towards? I always have to force myself to use larger brushes than I expect to. Uh, that's just my tendency typically is to use a smaller brush. And that's one of the reasons why I was really excited about doing the uh, doing the large brush, small brush day mm -hmm. uh, as part of our challenge just because it, it pushes that tendency. If you have a tendency to be a small brush person, go large. If you have a tendency to do just the opposite, then paint with the opposite. So uh, really looking forward to that day for that very reason. Yeah, I tend to use brushes that are too small, so I always have to remind myself to use larger brushes, but even for these, I didn't really use that big of brushes. I used, let me see, I used these three. So like the largest size was a four. So still pretty small, but you know, it's just what I like to do. As long as you're not getting tight same. with it. Hmm? Huh? Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I have the exact same tendency. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as long as you're not getting real tight with them, then I think it's okay. I just don't really like using bigger brushes. One, I hate cleaning them. I find cleaning them really annoying, and I never get all the paint off of them, so then I ruin them. Um, also, the handle is just like, kind of feels weird to hold. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a big fan of the larger brushes, because a large brush means you have a bigger, like a wider handle. And it sometimes like hurts my hand when I hold it. I wonder if there's any companies out there that have designed kind of a more ergonomic, larger brush handle that yeah. like, isn't necessarily in ratio and width to the brush head itself. Mm -hmm. you know That'd what I mean? That'd be really nice. Well, it's kind of like Parise's um, tools. They used to have them like really small, tools and they made oh. a much larger handle so that it's easier to hold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know they do that for um, crochet hooks. I don't know about knitting oh, needles, yeah. but they have like really thick handles so it's easier for you to hold. Knitting needles is a little different because you right. have to rely on the entire needle. Yeah, that's um, true. So it has to be a uniform size throughout. Yeah, and with crochet, it's all about the hook size, so. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. My great-grandmother taught me how to crochet. I love really? crochet. Back in the I day. didn't know that. Yeah, Aww. she sure did. I'm, you know, when I was like eight or nine, and you know, made, made a pair of slippers one time. 
Yep. She saw that I like to work with my hands very early on. Yeah. Did you ever make like Mother's Day gifts and crochet stuff? Uh, you know, I didn't. I, I I made I made like three things and like uh, made like like the traditional. You got to make the the the. Um, the granny square. The pot, yeah, the granny square oh, yeah. or the, the pot, you know, <laughs> pot, holder. Like pot holder, yeah. Yeah. Um, that you got to do that, you know. Uh, and I don't know about y'all, but did any of y'all have like the kids' loom that was like had the stretchy uh, cloth that you made like the pot holder with? The rubber bands. Yeah, they're like yeah. the rubber bands, but they're like rubber band cloth, you know, multicolored. Totally did that. Aww. That's like such a, just, I don't know, as a. Having had a professional textile design career and thinking about those little potholder looms, it just is <laughs> such a happy place. I don't Aww. know. I would totally be down to like make one now as a 30-year-old adult. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> They're so fun. <laughs> well, we'll have to do that. We we one night, um, if you what night was that? We had we had everybody over and pr my wife and Erica and you made, um, made friendship, friendship, bra bracelet. friendship bracelets yeah. to bring back those childhood memories. Yeah, I don't know um, if y'all remember like being a kid and getting like embroidery floss um, or like really thin yarn and weaving um, little bracelets together and giving them to your friends. Um, you can do like different designs, but we, we kept ours pretty simple because... I don't know, somehow we remembered how to do any of it after all this time. <laughs> yeah. That in itself was amazing. Yeah, that was fun. I have thought about bringing in a piece of one of my um, handwoven textiles at some point to use in part for a still life setup one of these days. Yeah, I think that could be fun. That'd be great. I want to see it. Yeah. This makes me want to just do a small little portrait painting, like full on. Like involved. Like involved, because this is like so. I'm having so much fun doing this. You know, I don't see know. You getting in there on the. Nostril. I know. I know. I'm getting. <laughs> you, I'm bad. Remember the shirt, Louis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What shirt? <laughs> you mean he's not topless? <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm, he, he wouldn't model nude, so I have to paint him in the nude. <laughs> Whether you like it or not. You're going nude. nude. <laughs> Can you imagine putting a little body on this? <laughs> like a little, I mean, like a body that big, because that's about all the room I have. <laughs> oh all my right. gosh, that reminds me of that that meme that I showed you, Lewis, several months ago from Reddit. Somebody, I don't know if anyone out there has seen this before, but I think it was titled Tom Hank, um, and it's an oil painting that somebody out there did. That's a portrait, an oil portrait of Tom Hanks, but the face is like you pinched it really. <laughs> Really small. <laughs> Tom um, Hank. Just Google Tom Hank oil I painting. Love that. Um, it's amazing. <laughs> Art can have a sense of humor sometimes. Oh, yeah. you know that's 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 the thing that sometimes uh, we need. We still need. You know, art artists can sometimes get a little too serious about things, and sometimes you just got to be like, you know, we got to we got to have a little bit of lightheartedness into this too. Um, and we've got three minutes left on that 10 minutes, just so y'all know. Perfect. So I was sitting in a community critique once with some artists that we would all get together once a month and just bring pieces and talk about them and help each other out. And at the time, I was doing like these hand cut multi layered stencils and just tiny little cuts. And down that rabbit hole of print making for a while there. And one of the artists who was a, she's actually like an amateur oil painter, just was why, why, why would you paint like this? Like she just couldn't get it around her head to have to spend so much time cutting these little holes out to blow spray paint through them, right? Mm -hmm. And the only thing that I could think of was, well, it's fun. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I actually had another artist pull this out here, but he could never answer a question like that. You know, when it comes to the painting and stuff. And to this day, I'm mean, like, what? I don't, why would I? Why would I not answer it that way? Mm-hmm. Hmm. It's okay that it's done. It has nothing to do with the quality or the. Yeah. Well, um, one of the reasons I paint is because it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> it, it doesn't devalue the work. Never. Aspect of it, you know, at all. No. I think if anything, it helps the work. Yeah, yeah exactly. It, you can tell. You can always tell when you're having a lot of fun painting something. Or that you care. You yeah. yeah. Get killed and tell your wine. Hey, right. That's sometimes where, you know, people think you have to have a profound reason to paint something. And, uh, and some people do, and that's, that's okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, sometimes if it's just because it's beautiful or because you love it, it's all the reason you need. Yeah. So... There's oh, plenty, yeah. There are plenty of times that it's not fun. <laughs> I didn't even think about you know that. That's that's so true. You, you need you need to counterbalance with fun things. From the trip, I was trying to do a plein air painting this week since I haven't started it. it. Turned out so horrible. I just wiped it. I just fussed around with it too much. Hmm. Mm. It's a like pendulum swinging between whimsy and dread. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was dread. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right, everyone. Well, is that it? That was the end of the ten. Minutes. That was the end. All right. Well, everyone, I, I hope this was helpful for y'all. Uh, thank you to Jay for coming and modeling for us today. It was fabulous. Um, just keep in mind, if you are working on these things, to uh, don't overthink it. Just have fun. That's going to be the theme of the day. And, um, you know, when in doubt, use larger brushes. Mm -hmm. Try to push you, your ideas, unique ideas that make it fun for you. And uh, tomorrow, get your palette ready. We're doing the Zorn palette. And we're going to have... Six images that if you can't seem to find an image that you know, it, and that that's a challenge for you. We're gonna have a, we're gonna have several images for you to choose from. Um, we will have them. I'm trying to think of where we're gonna put that resource. On the um, day of calendar. Okay, we're gonna put day. that resource on the day of calendar, uh, and we'll make sure that you have that available to you. Mm -hmm. And we look forward to seeing y'all then. And. Um, Please, if you haven't yet, just note that subscribing to this YouTube channel, ringing the bell, uh, and liking this really helps for other people to see it and participate. And uh, also, sign up for our Discord. The link is below in the description. We'd love to see what you're working on. There's been some fabulous people talking, a lot of chatter going on there, and we love it. So, um, looking forward to seeing y'all then. Have a great day until tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Bye, y'all. Thank you.